All right, welcome to the Bible study portion of episode 11. We are in chapter 9 of Genesis tonight. We just finished up the flood narrative, and now Noah and his sons and his family have come off the ark. And we're going to find that God here is going to tell them what he wants them to do on the new earth that he has made for them. And so if you have your Holy Bibles, why don't you open up to chapter 9 of the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, and we'll get started. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So right off the bat, you want to notice that the minute they got off the ark, what was the first thing God did for them? He blessed them. Hallelujah. And notice also that instead of God speaking directly to Noah as he had done in the past, now God is speaking to Noah and his sons. This was so that following the death of Noah, through hearing the voice of their creator, they would know that the commands for how they were to live on planet Earth were given by God himself and not some moral code that was handed down to them by their father. All right, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Once again, as in the earliest chapters of this book of Genesis, we can clearly see that from the beginning, homosexuality was frowned upon by God because there is no possible way that homosexuals can reproduce. Be fruitful and replenish the earth. There's just no way. Two men cannot produce offspring, and nor can two women produce babies through sexual relations. It is biologically impossible. So in this verse, as God had first commanded Adam and Eve, he now commands Noah and his sons to have sexual relations with their wives in order to produce children and repopulate the earth after the flood. That command remains in place to this very day for the human race. Men should take women as wives and make babies to continue producing life on this earth. That is God's will, plain and simple. By saying that men can love men sexually and women can love women because love is love and it's the 21st century and God has somehow evolved, it's just not true biblically and it's just not part of God's plan. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. He is the same in the beginning as he is in the coming end. He will always be the same. So you can't reshape or rewrite God's word to suit modern society. It doesn't work. And it may be politically incorrect for me to preach this, but it is certainly biblically correct. So we believers cannot beat around the bush today or evolve with the world around us when we are confronted with the question of what does God think of homosexual relations. It is a sin, is what his word says, plain and simple. And get it, I'm not saying that homosexuality is the worst sin in the world. I'm not singling out homosexuality as many people think. I'm not saying that they're worse sinners than I am. All sin is abominable in God's sight. He hates sin. He can't look at it. That's why we all need to be washed in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, so that we can come into his presence and commune with God. Without Jesus, if you're living in sin, you're not going to talk to the true God. I don't care what you say. We all sin and fall short of God's glory. I quoted that verse so many times in these holy Bible studies, but then I back it up with what it really means because a lot of times people will use that verse, as I pointed out in my first book, in the chapter about LGBT pride, a lot of people use that verse in defense of homosexuality. Saying, oh, well, we all sin, fall short of God's glory, so, you know, don't, don't pick on that sin. Um, if you're going to do that, then you have to talk about adultery and everything else. And if you read my writings, I do. I speak out against all sin. Every single human being on this earth sins. We all have different sins that we have become slaves to whether that be adultery, whether that be lying, whether that be gossip, whether that be stealing, whether it be unbridled lust and temptation of the eyes and of the flesh, blasphemy, using God's name in vain, not keeping the Sabbath, dishonoring parents, murder, 
and the list goes on and on and on. None of us are perfect. We all sin. I believe that there are over 600 sins listed in the pages of our Holy Bible. So there is a 100% chance that everyone listening to my voice tonight is currently committing much more than just one of them in your daily life. The reason that I harp on the sin of homosexuality so much is because the LGBT community is the most well-known group of sinners today that show no remorse or repentance for their sin. That's the difference. Instead, they celebrate their sin which is a slap in the face of our Creator and our Lawgiver. So I will continue to call out the LGBT Pride movement and keep right on telling them that how they are living is sin until the day that they start acknowledging that and repenting of it. Sadly, I don't foresee that happening anytime soon in our backslidden, godless society. But at the end of the day, every homosexual watching this video or hearing my voice can be forgiven of that sin today. You can know God as closely as I do today. And at the end of this video, I will tell you how easily you can do that. You're going to be surprised at how easy the good Lord has made it for you. So stick around because he loves you and he wants to know you and he wants you to know him. So back to verse 1. Men and women are to come together and produce offspring to replenish and repopulate the earth. That's a command by God. It's not a suggestion. Verse 2, In the fear of you, Noah and his sons, and his seed after him, and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Now, much like with Adam, God is giving Noah and his descendants, which would mean all of us, power over everything that he has created on the earth. Since we have been created in his image, he gives us dominion over the beasts of the earth, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, everything that grows on the earth, everything on this earth he has put under our control, under our dominion. And some of you may say, but what about animals that attack humans? How are they in fear of us? Well, biology backs that up. In studying animal life, you will find the majority of the animals that attack human beings are provoked in some way and mostly attack us out of fear. And you'll find that written in most studies on this. They use the word fear. Did you catch that? Fear. What does God's word say? The fear of you shall be upon every beast. Now, the animals, they do their best to go about their business and do their daily routines. But when you enter their environment and they feel that they or their families are threatened, they will attack out of fear or they will run in fear, just as God said they would to this very day. Verse 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Here God is saying that the beasts of the earth, fish of the sea, and birds of the air can also be food for us. Obviously, when we get to the dietary laws of Exodus and Leviticus, God is going to lay out which animals are good to eat and which are not to eat. He will refer to them as clean and unclean. So even though it says here that every other living thing besides other humans could be food for us, he later elaborates that though we could eat all of it, there are some things that are not good for us that we should not eat. He also mentions here the green herb for all of you vegetarians out there. You can eat that too, he says. But sorry friends, he is not talking about weed here. Unless you're going to literally eat that marijuana, which you normally roll up in smoke, which I would highly recommend that you do not do, because it probably will not end well. No, God here is talking about vegetables and herbs in verse 3. Not recreational drugs, as some baby Christians try and spin it to mean. And we'll find he prohibits 
he condemns the use of recreational drugs in the Holy Bible. So you can't use that verse or the verse in Genesis chapter 1 to say that God means it's all good to smoke pot and get high. doesn't mean that. Verse 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. So God's saying by eating the blood of the animal, it would be like cannibalism. Because the life of all creatures, man and beast, is in the blood. Now, this is powerful because there are many today that um, love hunting, right? And it's a sport to them to kill animals. Now, me, I'm a big Duck Dynasty fan. I wish they would bring it back on the air. I love them guys. Um, but look, they got a bad rap because a lot of the animal rights advocates said, oh, I can't watch that show. Those guys, they just kill animals all the time and they're inhumane. These people have obviously never watched the show because what they did was they lived off the land. They lived like biblical men would have lived. Anything they killed on that show or in their life today, they eat. So if they were out killing the ducks or if they killed a deer, or if they even killed squirrels sometimes. You watch at the end of that episode, that's the meal they're eating around that family table. That's what Miss K or whoever cooked up, and they're eating. So they weren't killing the animals just to kill them. Whatever they killed, they ate. And I respect that, because that's what God said. These animals shall be meat for you. How do you survive? How do you get your proteins? And How do you get your enzymes and all this other stuff? You can't get everything you need to survive simply through plants and vegetables. You have to eat meat. I mean, some people try to get around that and try not to eat meat, but, you know, it doesn't work. You don't get the, the necessary things that your body needs to um, function with a long, healthy life. That's why God's saying you can't eat animals for meat. But people who kill animals just out of sport, that's no better than you killing another human being. Because you're, you're doing it because you want to exert your power over that animal. You want to say, hey, I have bigger weapons than you, I have a bigger arsenal than you, I'm more powerful than you, and I'm going to show my dominance over you by killing you. I mean, people that do that, that put these trophy animals on the wall but don't eat them, you know, it's, it's sick. It's not, they're not right in the head. There's something wrong there. Maybe they're just insecure and they need to lord that power over something, and so they choose animals to do that. But they got to be careful because if you're shedding blood just to shed blood, it doesn't matter if it's a human or an animal. You're going to have to answer to God for it because he created that creature for a purpose. And if you're not, if that creature doesn't get to live its life for the purpose he created it for, and if you're not using it for the purpose he created it for, which would be for meat, and you're using it just to hang it on your wall, at the end of the day, again, you're going to have to answer to God, and I, I think you're going to be highly surprised at the response you're going to get from him. He's going to say, depart from me, you accursed. I never knew you. You're sick. You're like a cannibal. You're killing things just to kill them. And that's, you know, I'm a, I'm a pet owner. And I love my cat to death. And what I mean by that is I would protect him with my life. He's like a child to me. And, and the book of Proverbs, I believe, actually says, the righteous man careth for the life of his beast, of his pet. So if you own a pet, and you're not putting its needs before your own, I believe you're going to have to answer to God for that. Because he's putting it in your care, a life, in your care, just like he does children, to be a blessing unto you. And you need to be a blessing unto it because you're its parent now. You look out for it. You make sure it gets fed. You make sure it has somewhere to go to the bathroom. You make sure it gets its exercise. You make sure that it's healthy. That's why we take it to the vets, like we take children to doctors. So... If you are not caring for that pet, if you're negligent in caring for the life of that pet, again, you're going to have to answer to God just as much as if you're not doing the best to raise your child right in this world. And again, I live um, around a lot of nature. I see a lot of bunnies and squirrels and birds and groundhogs and raccoons and all the rest. I got a lot of animals out there. And it pains me so much when I see one of them 
um, just struggling or in danger or, you know, they can't find food or another animal attacks them or I hear just an animal screeching outside because another animal's attacking it. That, ah, oh, that breaks my heart, you know, because I, when I look in their eyes and I see them, they're, they're a creation of God. They're God's creatures. And, and to see them being torn apart or being hurt by another animal or another human being, it pains me just like it pains God when another human being takes the life of another human being and sheds innocent blood. Same with abortion. I talked about that um, in previous studies. Abortion is the shedding of innocent blood. And right now, as of today, since Roe v. Wade, over 60 million babies, 60 million lives, innocent blood has been shed and lives have been ended since I believe it was 1973. Friends, that's, that's around 50 years ago. 60 million. That's just unbelievable. I mean, how much blood does God see on America's hands? Honestly, I mean, that's why people could say all day long, all oh, these conservative Christians and this pro-life president, uh, we need to get them out of office because they're, they're against women's rights. We're not against women's rights. We're against women murdering innocent lives. Okay? So... God cares for all innocent blood, whether it be man or beast, you got to get it. Because the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, so the life is in the blood. You shed that blood, you end that life before God wanted it to, you answer to him at the end of the road. And I would not want to be in your shoes. Verse 5, surely your blood of your lives will I require. So whenever you take the life of an innocent beast or an innocent man, and when I say innocent beast, I don't mean again by hunting, but I mean by blood sport. So you hear about these little hellion kids on the news, teenagers who um, take a litter of kittens or puppies and throw them in a trash can and then set it on fire after pouring gasoline in it. That is just sick. These kids are mentally ill. We're going to talk about capital punishment here in a minute. I believe somebody like that, I don't care if it's an animal and not a man. To me, if they can do that to poor little defenseless animals, they'll do that to another human being. So they need to be put to death just like another human being would be put to death for murder. Because you're murdering God's creation without remorse. You're sick in the head. So God's saying... At the hand of every man will I require it. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Verse 6. For whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. I made this point in previous studies. When you murder another human being like the Islamists do, how they murder Christians and Jews because we don't believe in their God Allah, that's why we, you never see Christians and Jews murdering Muslims. You'll never see it. Because our God says all, all men and women were created in his image. Now, they may not all know him. He gives them all the choice to know him and come to him. But these other false gods like Allah are saying, if they don't believe in me, you go kill them. You kill the infidel. You kill the Jew. You kill the Christian. Our God doesn't say that. Our God says turn the other cheek. Because they may someday convert to him, come to him, and if you take their life before that, you're messing with his plan, and you're taking a life that was created in his image. So, I hate Islam, I hate Allah, I'm not friendly with most of the Muslims that are devout, devout Muslims, because our books just don't agree, and I don't agree with their beliefs in any way whatsoever. I mean, the way they sacrifice their animals is inhumane, that halal. I mean, they slit the throat of the animals alive, and watch them bleed as they pray their little prayer over it. So that gets into the shedding innocent blood part here. Because, I mean, at least when, when God had the Jews sacrifice animals to him back in the Old Testament before Jesus came, it was done in a humane way. And the animals weren't wasted. I mean, whatever they could eat of it, they ate of it. They would give some to the priests, and then they would eat some, and they would burn some. But these Islamists, like I said, they don't kill the animals humanely. They... they slit their throats while they were alive, and they let them bleed out in pain. That is just sick. That's a sick God they serve. So I, I don't get along with a lot of them. 
I, do I try and be at peace with them? I try and be at peace with all men, like St. Paul says. But sometimes it's just, just not possible. That's why he said, be at peace with all men whenever possible. So whoso sheddeth man's blood, talking about these Islamists, or just flat out murderers, by man shall his blood be shed. What does that mean? All these um, people today, these liberals who get upset about capital punishment. Oh, it's wrong. We shouldn't put people to death. We should just put them in jail and let them waste away forever. God laid it out here in the very first book of the Holy Bible. If you murder another human being with intent, willful intent, and no repentance, and no sign of remorse, by the hand of another man, you shall be put to death. Can't get more clear cut than that, friends. And real quick, I want to talk about the difference between incidental killing and intentional murder. Because people will say, okay, God said do not kill in the Holy Bible. That means that all people who fight in the army and defend America and defend Israel, all of them are going to hell because they're killing. The word there in Exodus in which Jesus corrected the translation in the New Testament is do no murder. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder. There's a difference. Okay, if someone is coming against your house with your family inside, and they're saying, I'm going to break down that door, and I'm going to kill your kids, you have a weapon in your house. Are you going to defend them? Are you going to kill that man before he kills your kids? Absolutely you will if you're a good parent. So that would be killing, because you're taking the life of another human being in defense, like our army does. God said in the book of Proverbs, I believe, there's a time for peace and a time for war. So he says there's going to be war. All throughout the Old Testament, he's telling them to go kill the abominable people that are going to defile and pollute the land and their children, and that is going to cause God's judgment to come upon them because of all the abominable things they were doing with each other and with animals and whatnot. God's saying, wipe that abominable race out like he had to do with the flood. He had to take out the bad, corrupted, evil, wicked people who would make life so much harder and so much more painful for the good people on the earth, the righteous people, the peaceful people. So in those wars, you're killing. Now, if a man sneaks around the back of your house and sees you sitting out front on your patio and pulls the trigger, shoots you in the head, that's murder. He's intentionally killing you for no reason. You're not threatening his life. You're not threatening his family's life. You're not at war with him. That's murder. So there's a difference. Killing, murder. And I call them incidental and intentional. That's how God looks at it. So you shall not do the intentional part. You shall not murder. And again, whether that be man or beast. Because incidental killing of a beast would be you kill it, you eat it. Like God commanded. Intentional murder is just going out and shooting a rabbit in the head in your backyard and leaving it there. That's murder. And, you know, abortion. I go right back to it. They say that, you know, in order to make the woman's life easier, because, you know, she's financially burdened or whatever, she's just not ready for a child, Number one, you shouldn't be having sex at a young age if you're not ready for a child because eventually birth control is not going to work and you're going to have one. So I don't want to hear that excuse that she's too young. If she's too young, then you want to keep her locked up at home and don't let her be running around with little thugs that are going to get her pregnant. You know what I'm saying? Other than that, you're not being a good parent and I don't want to hear it from you why you allowed her to get an abortion. Abortion is murder across the board. It doesn't matter um, if what term, whether it be um, six weeks or six months or however long it's in the womb, nine months, it doesn't matter. And, and these Democrats today are talking about killing the baby after it's already born and on the operating table and the doctor's talking to the mother saying, well, do you want it or not? Because if not, we'll just take its life right here. So after the baby's already born, they're talking about killing it, which is called infanticide. Murder, friends. Murder. God's saying, if you shed the blood of another human being, your blood is going to be shed by another human being. One way or the other, 
It's going to come around at you. All right, verse 7. And you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply there. And so again, be fruitful and multiply. Can't do that with two men. Can't do that with two women. God's obviously saying here, you men, you women, come together, produce offspring, replenish the earth, bring forth abundantly. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. So the covenant here that God is establishing is unlike the covenant he'll establish with Israel and with the Jews. This covenant is with the entire human race, with all the beasts of the earth, every living thing on the earth. This covenant is with everybody up until this very day. He says, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. Now, one thing you got to get here is a lot of people say, okay, God said he would never destroy the earth again. It's not true. You have to read the fine print. I will never destroy the earth by the waters of a flood again. So there will never be another global flood ever again. I don't care what anybody tells you. It's just not possible. It's not going to happen because God said it wouldn't happen. But he did say, you know, at the end of the tribulation hour, there is going to be a global judgment very similar to that of the flood, and it's going to destroy the earth. And that is written about in 2 Peter, in which he says that the earth will be destroyed by fire. So the first time was with water, the second destruction of the earth will be by fire. So you don't want to be around for that. And if you don't, if you think you're going to be left behind, again, get this book for you or any loved ones you think might be left behind. It's going to show you what the tribulation is all about, and you're not going to want to be here for that. You're not going to want to be here for that. Okay, God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh is upon the earth. Bow here, obviously, that means today what we would know is a rainbow. So I always get excited, you know, whenever I see, you know, just a well-defined, colorful rainbow in the sky. It always touches my heart. I always, in the spirit, <clears throat> feel so joyful and uh, content and comforted because it, it's, it's just God smiling down on us saying, Hey, just letting you know I remember my covenant. I remember you, all of you, every living thing, man and beast. Just saying, hey, just drop it in to say, I remember you. That's just awesome. I love it. And uh, that's why I get angry when the LGBT pride movement hijacks the rainbow for their flags and, and the sign of their movement. It's, you want to talk about provoking God. The rainbow was the sign um, that came upon the righteous men of the earth and his new creations, letting them know, hey, I care for you. I love you. You're not like that old, sinful, wicked race that was on the earth that I had to destroy. So I'm making this new covenant with you, a righteous people, a people that loves their God and follows their God. And meanwhile, this movement who does not love God, who mocks God, who breaks his law without repentance, takes that symbol of God's love and God's covenant with a righteous people. And they hijack her for their movement. And then they, they mock and they attack 
and they do everything they can to humiliate and spread false witness against righteous people of God. And yet they're using his symbol, his token of his covenant, for their logo. It's just, it's sick. It's not right. All right, and we are in verse 17. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So I mentioned a little bit about Shem um, in most of the previous Bible studies. Leading up to this study, I've, I've mentioned Ham and Japheth in passing. Basically, the next chapter is going to be a lot about them, because we're going to talk about how the nations were created through these three sons of Noah. Um, but just real quick, so you can get a gist of who these guys are, Shem is the good guy, basically. Ham is the bad guy. Japheth is just, you know, that guy who just does what he does, you know what I'm saying? He's just there. Um, okay, so Shem is associated with the Semites. Have you ever heard the term anti-Semite when somebody's like anti-Jewish? That's because Shem was the father of the Hebrews, who of course we know are the Jews, and then later the Israelites. And Shem is going to be part of that righteous line through whom Jesus Christ is going to descend. Through whom uh, Moses and, and uh, David and, and the rest all come through. That's the line Jesus is going to come through. Shem. So Shem is the most important guy we want to pay attention to throughout uh, the mentions of Shem, Ham, and Japheth in the Old Testament. He's the guy that's important, that's going to matter. Ham, not so much. Ham is the example of what we don't want to be like. And he is historically the father of the Arabs in the Middle East and Africans. Now, before any of you get on me, um, you know, saying this is racist or whatever, that Ham's the bad guy, yet he's the father of the Arabs and the Africans, I'm just telling you how God's Word says it, but God's Word also says that not all of the descendants of Ham are bad. What I mean by that is that there are many Christian Arabs. They're not all radical Islamists. There are many Christian Africans. They're not all radical Middle East Islamists, like in Nigeria and, um, you know, Sudan. Those are the Africans that basically descended from Ham, the ones that are leading Boko Haram and all these Islamic terror groups. Um, because again, Muslims aren't just Arabic. They're also African-American in the Middle East. Most of Africa, unfortunately, is Islamic. So the Arabs and Africans who don't adhere to the vile, violent religion of Allah, Islam, and that are Christians, or even that belong to no religion at all, they're not so much um, examples of the descendants of Ham. They would be more falling into the tent of Japheth. What I mean by that is Japheth is the father of the Europeans and Asians and the Western world, which would include America. That's who Japheth is the father of. So anybody that's not Jewish and that's not Arab or African Middle Eastern would fall into the tribe of Japheth here, okay? It's not really a tribe, but the, the family of Japheth. But the thing is, we can be instituted into, we can be brought into that family tree of Shem through Jesus Christ. So even though I would normally be referred to as a child of Japheth, I am now a child of Shem, not because I'm Jewish. I'm unfortunately a poor, weak, and perfect Gentile. But Jesus Christ grafted me into the tree of Shem, that family tree, through which all the holy righteous men of God descended from. Just like me as a white guy, it's the same for black guys and for Arabs, Asians, everybody. We can all be grafted into that tree. Even though we're not Jewish, we're not going to become Jewish. We just become part of God's family through Jesus. We become part of the line of Shem. Other than that, though, the secular world... Uh, the Buddhists, the Hindus, everybody else, uh, they are all 
still sons of Japheth. While we are not, we are not sons of Shem. Meanwhile, all the Islamists and all the Africans who are, you know, murdering Christians left and right in the Middle East, they are part of that family of Ham, the bad guys. And I like to use the example that Ham is like um, the reemergence of the line of Cain. Even though the line of Cain was wiped out in the flood, basically Ham is like the new birth of Cain. His family and his descendants are going to do some abominable things, and we're going to read about one of them right here from the start in this very chapter. So that's just a real quick gist of what these three guys are about. Again, Shem is the one you really want to pay attention to. And I'm going to talk a lot more about them in the coming Holy Bible study next week. Now we're going to get into a weird story here, but, you know, it's got to cover it, and I'm going to try and explain it the best I can. Okay. Verse 20, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Now, you all know what vineyard is. That's what we get grapes from, right? And then, of course, you can create wine from that. And he drank the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. All right, Noah was drunken and uncovered. Obviously uncovered here. It's not a secret, and he was naked. This just goes to show that even the most righteous of men throughout history and today will stumble and fall into sin. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The only, only, only sinless man, sinless man in human history was the God-man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So while Noah, Moses, David, Daniel, and the rest of the Old Testament men of God were holier than most and were men after God's own heart, the Bible tells us, they still sin, just as we all do today. They all looked forward in anticipation for the redemption of their bodies in the future through a coming Messiah. Yet we who are living know that the Christ, the Messiah that they have been waiting for, has arrived, and his name is Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So, Noah, unfortunately, just like the rest, was a poor sinner. I mean, as long as we dwell in this carnal flesh, we're sinners. St. Paul said, That which I want to do, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I do. He hated it. He loathed it. I'm the same way. Every one of us does things every day that we wish we could take back and say, Man, that wasn't too holy. You know, I should have watched my mouth on that, or my eyes shouldn't have looked at that, or I shouldn't have thought that thought. Every single one of us watching this, I don't care. You can say you're the holiest Christian in the world. I don't believe you. Jesus Christ is the holiest. You're a sinner. You need to repent of it like I do every day and just keep on trying to get better. But none of us are ever going to be perfect and sinless except for Jesus. And that's why we all need him. That's why we all need him. So Noah sinned by getting drunk because later on in the Holy Bible, God is going to say, drunkenness is bad. Both Old Testament and New say, don't get drunk. Now, here, Noah's a perfect example of why God said that, because from the start we see that the wine and the alcohol, the hard liquor, whatever, eventually it starts to affect your mind and your thoughts, just like recreational drugs do. And it does so in unnatural ways. It makes you think of things and do things you would not do if you were sober. It really it blurs the line between right and wrong, and it kind of leans you more towards wrong. It makes you more rebellious. There's something in the alcohol that makes you more rebellious. Um, drugginess and getting high on drugs brings, you, brings your spiritual guard down. It opens the door for the devil and his demons to enter in. Now, in this instance, for whatever reason, they led Noah to get naked. Now, had his wife passed on by this time of his life? I mean, we aren't told that in the scripture. We aren't really told much about his wife at all. Now, if she had passed on, is it possible that he was attempting to release some sexual tension that he built up? Maybe he saw, you know, some new um, women that were born on the earth to his sons. Uh, maybe they were like 18, 19 now. And, you know, they were out there in their little, I'm sure they didn't have bikinis back then, obviously, but... You know, maybe they're little goat skins they formed into, like, bikinis or something. I don't know. And he kind of got, you know, feeling the lust and temptation for him. 
because his wife was gone and he hadn't had sexual relations in a while. So maybe that's why he got naked. I'm not saying that's what happened. It's just conjecture. I don't know. I wasn't there. None of us were. So no one today can say that they know the exact reason why Noah got naked because it isn't recorded and it isn't meant for us to know apparently. As we are told in this verse, he got drunk, sloppy obviously, and ended up naked or uncovered. That's all we know. And I think that's all God wants us to know is that Noah sinned and here's what happened after that sin. It says, uh, verse 22, Ham, again the bad guy here, the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren, Shem and Japheth, without. Now the reason they say here that he's the father of Canaan, and they don't really mention children of Shem and Japheth in this chapter, is because of something Noah's going to do regarding Canaan at the close of this chapter. That's why it says here he's the father of Canaan, because they want you to know he's the child of Ham. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. So basically Ham was a pervert. Okay, so any perverts in our society today, whatever that may be, sexual perversion, that's personified in Ham. He walked in, saw his father naked, and he go, oh, oh, should not have seen that. I'll see you later. I went the other way. He was a kind of, he may have even been homosexual, there, there's some conjectures. And there's reason to believe that in some of the old Hebrew texts that he may have maybe done something to Noah when he was drunk and passed out. Now that's, I, again, it's conjecture. I'm not going to say it's here nor there, but so Ham could also be known as, you know, a relation to the homosexual uh, sins of today. So not only after he did that, he saw the nakedness of his father and God forbid did anything to his father. He went and told his brothers, like, ah, come here, look at this. Come look at dad, he's naked. I mean, dad is just a bad son. That's a wicked son. So again, you see how he's going to be the father of the new wicked line, just as Cain was the father of a wicked line. Shem and Japheth, on the other hand, the, the, the righteous children of Noah, they went in backwards so they didn't see him naked after they had heard about him being naked. They covered him up, and they walked out. Now, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, see, that's what gets me there. It's like, um, I don't know if Shem and Japheth had told Noah and said, look, Ham, he's just perverted. He came out and told us you were naked. He wanted us to go look at you, <clears throat> all this other stuff. That may be what it's referring to here. And the fact that Noah knew they must have either told him or, again, this could get in that conjecture of Ham did something sexually, homosexually, to Noah. I hate to even talk about that, but it just goes to show how abominable the descendants of Ham are. So it's a good thing to get in your head because later on God's going to have these, these Canaanites, this, this sinful generation of men, wiped out. And a lot of people say today, why does God wipe all these peoples out, the Canaanites and the Amorites and the etc., etc.? You have to know what kind of people they were. They were wicked, they were evil, they were the rapists, murderers, pedophiles, um, homosexual sodomites, and, and, and just um, animal abusers and killers. I mean, they were sick, abominable people. If you go back and you read the history of the Canaanites, and you read about when they would sacrifice their children... It's not like abortion today where we just, you know, murder them in the womb. They would take the children alive and they would bury them alive as sacrifices to their gods. Bury their children alive to Molech or Bel or whoever. So yeah, it was a sick, sick race that descended from him. But now in verse 25 it says, Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now, there are some who say, like other verses in the Holy Bible, that somehow this justifies slavery, and if you know the Word of God truly, front to back, it does not. I can see why it would be an excuse why some people would try and twist it and turn it to make it look like it condones slavery, and maybe that's what people did throughout history. I don't know what led them to take slaves, but, you know, it's possible only for the fact that at this time on the earth, like I said, Shem was the father of the Semites, the Jews, and then Japheth was the father of the Gentiles, which would be the Asians and the Europeans and all them. 
and then Ham would be the fathers of the Arabs and the Africans. But since then, throughout history, once they left the Middle East, um, or if they changed their belief system, say if, you know, the children of Ham again converted to Christianity and became Christians or became Jewish or whatever, then they believed in Yahweh and Yeshua and they were grafted into the family tree. If they were part of the secular world, if they were part of the godless, foreign god world of, of Allah and Bel and Molech and Ishtar and all the rest, then, you know, then they were meant to be slaves because they were not child, children of the true gods. So they didn't have his protection. They didn't have his blessings. So they were cursed, just like Canaan was cursed. But this isn't referring to all Arabs. It's not referring to all black people. It, it just, to read, it, to read it like that and to teach it like that is just irresponsible theology. And it's totally wrong because if you read the Holy Bible from front to back in context, God is colorblind. What I mean by that is he doesn't see us in white, black, brown, yellow, red, purple, blue. He doesn't see us in color. He sees us in either two colors, black, stained in sin, and I don't mean dark skin, brown skin, I mean black, black as night, drenched in sin. Or he sees us blood, red, in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So either we're covered in sin, black, or we're covered in Christ's blood. That's how he sees us. So it doesn't matter, again, if you're white, yellow, brown, black, does it matter? And when I say black in that sense, I mean dark brown. But, so you're not confused. God here wasn't referring to a certain color. Because the color of our skin only comes from where we're born or where our ancestors were born continentally. So obviously if you're born in an area of the world where it's hotter and the sun is out more, you're going to be darker. If you're born in an area of the world where it's colder, you're going to be whiter. It's just the way it is. But that doesn't change the fact that there's dark Christians and there's white Christians. There's dark Jews and there's white Jews. It doesn't change the fact. So sons of Shem can be both white and dark. Sons of Japheth can be both white and dark. It doesn't matter. But at this time, that's who their descendants were. Okay, I want you to get that. So today we need to look at this and read this verse in a spiritual sense and not in a physical color of skin sense. So when he says, Cursed be Canaan, son of Ham, a servant of servants shall he be unto Shem and unto Japheth. It didn't mean that all Arabs and Africans were to serve the Jews and the Gentiles. It didn't mean that. What it meant was anyone who stemmed from that line of Ham, meaning wicked, evil, abominable, godless, false god-worshipping people of the world, they are not of our God. And we're going to find that in the next verse. God actually elaborates on what I'm teaching. They are not of our God. So they, in God's eyes, shall be servants of servants, meaning the, the worst of servants, the lowest of the low. They're going to be servants unto his children, his chosen one, the Jews, the line of Shem, and the Gentiles, Japheth, who are grafted into the family of Shem through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I was saying, God elaborates in the next verse, and he said, Noah said, Blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Why didn't he say, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and Ham. He said the God of Shem because he's saying Ham is a pervert. Ham is unholy. Ham does not serve the God of gods. He does not serve the God that put me on that ark and that brought me safely through that flood and got me and my family off the ark. Ham doesn't serve that God. And we're going to find, if you study the history of the Canaanites, they did not serve that God. They went off and they served the false gods. So, if you are a son of Almighty God through Jesus Christ, or if you are a Jew, you were born of Yahweh, and you are in that family tree of Shem, right? And us Christians are grafted into that tree through Jesus, by his blood, 
which he shed on the cross to cleanse us of our sins and make us blood red in God's sight. Canaan shall be their servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So God's saying Canaan's going to be Japheth's servant too. And, and when he says enlarge Japheth, you're going to notice that when all the land is taken in the world by these three sons of Noah and their families, Japheth fills the most of it. Because Shem, we're going to read here um, where it says dwelt in the tents of Shem. Tents refers to, he's, he's localized. Okay, so that's that land of Israel we know today. He's, he was primarily in that land, and his descendants would remain in that land, whereas Japheth was going to spread out the Gentile world, whereas the Jewish world was centered in that little area of the Middle East, whereas the um, children of Ham, you know, they went out in the uh, other directions in the Middle East, so they didn't stay confined to that little area. They were going, you know, north, south, east, east west, um, in the Middle East region, but primarily I believe they were going south, east, and west, if I'm not mistaken, and then Japheth, I believe, initially started to go north. But um, we'll get into that in the next chapter, because it talks about, you know, where they went, and their descendants, and this and that. So we'll talk a lot more about that in the next study. Anyways, Japheth's going to have a lot of land. Shem's going to be localized. Ham's going to pretty much surround him. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So Noah lived almost a thousand years, uh, much like Adam and, and Methuselah and the other um, you know, men of God before him. Now, the thing that you want to understand is you're saying, okay, but after the flood, didn't God say not too long ago that he was going to bring their lives down to 120 years? That didn't apply to Noah. That didn't apply to Noah because he was part of the generations of Adam before the flood. So it was going to be everybody post-flood whose lifespans were going to be dwindled down to around 120 years. And we're going to read about that going forward. You'll notice their, their lifespans will start to slowly dwindle off. Now, earlier in this study, I had said that if you were homosexual and you wanted to know God like I know God, I was going to give you a chance to do that at the end of this episode. And you can see now why you don't want to be associated with Ham. And unfortunately, if you are a homosexual today, especially an unrepentant homosexual, you are associated with Ham. You're not associated with Shem. But you can be associated with Shem. If you had the choice after listening to this study today, honestly, if I told you, which family do you want to be a part of? Do you want to be a part of Shem's family, Ham's family, or Japheth's family? Honestly, in your heart of hearts, which family would you choose? If you say Ham, just turn off this Bible study now. I don't want to know you. And if you say Japheth, you just weren't paying attention. If you say Shem, which every one of you should say, I'm going to tell you how you can become a part of that family. And again, I don't care if you're a homosexual right now. I don't care if you're the biggest liar on the block or a thief or an adulterer. I don't care what you are because the only thing God cares about is who you're going to become. And this very night, you can become a child of Shem and thus become a child of God through the most righteous man to ever live and descend from Shem, who was the God-man, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and shed that sinless blood to make you red in the sight of the Father in heaven and not black and alienated from him and your sin. You can know that God today through Jesus. And it's very simple. I told you, God makes it so easy. Today, you don't have to become the holiest person on your block. You're still going to struggle with the sins you struggle with today, but it's going to get a lot easier from this night forth. And as you get into this book and you study this book and you set your mind to this book instead of setting your mind to the abominable things you watch on television, 
or the abominable things you watch on your computer, which I think y'all know what I'm talking about. If you set your mind and your eyes on this, you watch how your life will quickly be transformed far more than you could have ever imagined it could have been. Friends, I'm living proof. I've said it before. I was the worst sinner on the block for over a decade. Never thought I'd be preaching the Holy Bible. Ever. I thought I was on a highway to hell and that's where I was going to end up. But somehow, some way, God changed me. God saved me. Made me a new creation. He can do the same for you. So I don't care how far you are from Him tonight. How far you are away from God. You can get close right now by praying this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus... I'm a sinner. I struggle so much with sin. I do things I don't want to do. I can't control it. It's either through the drinking or the drugs or the things I see on television or just the peer pressure or it's just something I feel inside because I was abused as a child or something. Jesus, I'm a sinner, period, and I want to change, and I need your help. You can make me whole and happy, and content, and you can help me to flee from the sins which have had control over me, and which have enslaved me for so long. So from this night forth, Jesus, be my Savior, be my Lord, wash me in your blood, cleanse me in your blood, make me a child of God, a new creation, this very moment, I pray it in your holy name, Lord Jesus, for the greater glory of our God and Father in heaven, Yahweh. Amen. Friends, if you just prayed that prayer, you truly have become a new creation. You may not even know it yet, but the Holy Spirit is coming down. He's going to start working on you. You watch. You're not going to be able to watch the things you watched before. You're not going to be able to live the way you lived before. Because now, before you had a little conscience, which is inside of all of us, now, as of today, you're going to have the Holy Spirit who is going to work on you. He's going to show you right from wrong. He's going to show you good from evil. He's going to show you what pleases God and what doesn't please God. And he's going to start to, um, you know, make you feel a lot more convicted over the things you do, which you normally feel comfortable doing. Now, don't, don't get scared of that. That's how you know that Jesus just answered your prayer. When you start to feel that conviction you've never felt before, that's how you know He has just gifted you with the Spirit and He's drawing you to Himself. He's going to be your Lord. He's going to be your God. You're saved. You're not going to be left behind for the greatest tribulation that the world has ever seen. You are going up in the rapture with me now. Be happy. Be thankful. You were a sinner before you started listening to this on YouTube today. And now, as I end this video... You are now a child of God. You are just as blessed in God's sight now as I am. You know God now just as closely as I do. It may not seem like it, but you watch. He's going to start to talk to you. He's going to start to guide you. He's going to start to fill your life with peace and contentment and joy and serenity, the likes of which you've never known. All you have got to do is make an honest effort to change your simple ways. The word repent means to turn, to change. That's on you. Now, if you fall back into your sins and you say, you know what, I know I wanted to try that Jesus thing, but it really didn't work for me. People say you can't lose your salvation, but eventually, if you go back to doing the things you were doing before, you're basically spitting on Christ's sacrifice, and it's like you never accepted him in the first place. So don't let the devil do that. But at the same time, I believe if you truly did pray that prayer and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will not allow you to do that. No matter how far you stray, He will seek you out. The Holy Bible says when He had 100 sheep, 99 of them were in His flock. One of them went astray. He left the 99 to go find the one. You're that one. No matter how far you stray, He's going to find you. He's going to bring you back to Him because He loves you. He doesn't want you to see you go through the judgments that are going to befall the world in the near future. He wants you to be blessed and to dwell with Him in the mansions He has prepared for us in heaven.
Friends, I hope you all enjoyed this Bible study. I hope you all tune in next week for the chapter 10 Bible study. And as always, God bless you all and Godspeed.